Good afternoon. Um, uh, I have completed the review, and of course I'm now messing up your microphone. I've completed my review of the officer-involved shooting from September 5th of 2015. Uh, my review consisted of reviewing the Virginia Beach Police Department's investigation into the matter, as well as my office's own independent review and investigation into it. I think it's important to state up front that the purpose of my review is not to examine police tactics or procedures. The purpose of my review is solely to determine whether or not a crime was committed by the police officers when they discharged their firearm on September 5th. So I'm going to go through my findings, and then I'll be happy to take questions um, at, at the end. I think it's important that we all understand how it is that the SWAT team and the vehicle driven by India Kager with Angelo Perry in it ended up at that 7-Eleven parking lot on September 5th of 2015. The Virginia Beach Police Department was investigating two murders in a home invasion, robbery, malicious wounding um, charge, three separate offenses that they were, they were investigating, three separate events. Um, when they were pro uh, approached by a confidential informant in the end of August of 2015, the informant shared with them information that the individual responsible for those offenses was uh, a person by the name of Bless Eye. Uh, the Virginia Beach Police Department looked into um, that name and were able to determine that that was actually Angelo Perry. Angelo Perry had been previously convicted here in Virginia Beach of malicious wounding. He had also been convicted of use of a firearm and commission of felony and also assault and battery of a law enforcement officer. He was actually still on probation and had only been released from prison in 2014. He was still on probation uh, for the malicious wounding and the use of the firearm charge. He quickly became the main suspect in those two murder charges and the home invasion. The confidential informant came back to the detectives on September 4th. At that point in time, uh, he informed them that a Virginia Beach resident uh, was uh, the subject of a hit, that a hit had been put out on this Virginia Beach resident, that a, the Bless Eye or Angelo Perry had agreed to, to commit this murder, and that he would be coming from Maryland down to Virginia Beach probably within the next day to do just that. The Virginia Beach Police Department um, tried several times to make contact with the intended victim of that murder and were unsuccessful in doing so. As a result, they sought under the statutory authority to do so permission to begin to ping or track Angelo Perry's cell phone so that they could try and determine a general location of where he was. Over the course of the next day into September 5th, they began to see that Angelo Perry's phone was moving from Maryland down towards Virginia Beach. It was determined at that point in time, since they were unable to reach the victim, that uh, they would monitor Angelo Perry when he arrived in the city of Virginia Beach, and if he were, in fact, to attempt to commit a further act of violence, that they would try to stop him. They subsequently received information that night that Angelo Perry had arrived at the Scarborough Square neighborhood here in Virginia Beach. Um, in addition to the fact that he was present there, they were also told uh, by their informant that Angelo Perry was armed with handguns and that uh, he was riding in a blue Cadillac with Maryland tags on it. Um, also that there was suspicion that the murder of the, in, the, the intended victim that he was coming here, that that was to take place that evening. When Perry left the Scarborough Square neighborhood, at that point, undercover officers began to follow the blue Cadillac 
uh, when it left that neighborhood. Uh, the undercover detectives were able to confirm uh, that Perry was in the passenger side of the vehicle and they were able to state that there was a female driver in the vehicle who they did not know and they believed that there was a possibility of a third individual in the back seat at that time. As they were following the Cadillac, the Cadillac was moving from Scarborough Square towards the location of the intended victim's residence um, that supposedly Angelo Perry was here to murder. As they were following the Cadillac, the driving started to become erratic. And when I say erratic, um, it, while going up Lynn Haven Parkway, the vehicle would turn from the main traffic lanes into turn lanes only to at the last second come back out onto the main lanes of Lynn Haven Parkway, making it extremely difficult for the undercover vehicles to be able to, to follow and monitor the blue Cadillac. Eventually, the uh, Cadillac pulled into the Salem Crossing Shopping Center, went through the uh, parking lot, to behind the shopping center itself. There, the vehicle made a U-turn, came back out from behind the shopping center, and actually at that point, passed several of the undercover vehicles with officers in there that, that had been following the blue Cadillac. It was at this point that the officers um, became aware of the fact and had, had come to the conclusion that Perry was aware of their presence and, and that, uh, that he, was, he was being followed by the police. As the Cadillac left the parking lot pulling into the connected 7-Eleven parking lot there on Lynn Haven Parkway, the determination was made by the police department at that point that they would stop Angelo Perry and take him into custody um, since they had reliable information at that point that not only was he a convicted felon um, who was here to commit a violent act, but on top of that, that they had received reliable information that he was armed with handguns at that point. That in and of itself is a felony offense of a felon in possession of a handgun or firearm, and they had the legal authority to detain and take him into custody at that point. The Cadillac pulls into the uh, parking spaces there at the 7-Eleven. Two SWAT vehicles pull up behind the blue Cadillac. One of them makes contact with the, the rear of the Cadillac as they pull up. A flashbang distraction device is thrown by the officers to the front of the, the uh, blue Cadillac vehicle. And as that is taking place, five SWAT officers come from the rear of, of the SWAT vehicle, moving up the passenger side of the blue Cadillac. The SWAT officers all had markings of police on them. Um, in addition to that, they were all yelling, police, show me your hands. Uh, when the first officer in the line of the five officers got to Mr. Perry's window on the passenger side, the officer noticed that the window glass broke out towards him. The other officers in the line at that point um, saw a handgun in Mr. Perry's hand and realized that he was firing at the officers. All uh, of the officers realized at that point that Perry was firing at them. The first four officers returned fire. Uh, the fifth officer did not fire because he did not have a clear line of sight, could not see Mr. Perry, could not see the weapon, and he did not discharge his firearm. The, force, the first four officers did discharge their firearms. Perry was able to get off four rounds at the police. They returned 30 rounds of fire. Um, 
after he had fired upon them. They did not fire until Mr. F Perry had shot at them first. They stopped firing their weapons when he eventually lowered the gun. He actually lowered his weapon without releasing it um, and then eventually let go of it. But the officer stopped shooting when he did, in fact, lower his gun. What is very important to note at this point in time is that why this exchange of fire was going back and forth. Uh, Mr. Perry changed his position in the vehicle. He changed his position so that his feet were against the passenger door and he had placed his back against India Kager, who was the driver of the vehicle, and against her and against the driver's seat, placing Ms. Kager directly in the line of fire of the officers as he was shooting at them. As soon as the, the exchange of, of a fire had ended, the police immediately came up, removed India Kager from the vehicle, and started to try and treat, treat her wounds and give her CPR. Unfortunately, she died at the scene, as well as Mr. Perry was, was dead in the vehicle. It was at this point that the uh, officers first realized that there was an infant in the back seat of the vehicle. Luckily, the infant was unharmed um, in the exchange of firefight. So, also, uh, at the conclusion of, of the scene becoming secure, the conclusion of, of the, the exchange of fire between the officers and Mr. Perry, uh, the first officer who had arrived up at the side window of Mr. Perry, uh, when he saw the glass breaking out towards him, began to examine his uniform and learned that a bullet had gone through his uniform and had gone through his undershirt, um, but did not actually strike his body. So these are the events that occurred. My analysis then of the law brings me to taking a look at the officer's actions on that evening. And I will explain that in a police-involved shooting, the officer's actions have to be uh, determined to be objectively reasonable in the light of the facts and circumstances confronting the officers at the time. Well, the facts and circumstances confronting the officers on September 5th were very clear. Angelo Perry was a felon convicted multiple times of violent offenses. He had previously been convicted of using a firearm in the commission of a felony. The police had received reliable information that he was armed when he left the Scarborough Square neighborhood, therefore committing a new felony offense of felon in possession of a firearm. He was the main suspect in two murder investigations and a home invasion robbery malicious wounding investigation, which as previously uh, released by Virginia Beach Police Chief Severa, a ballistics analysis performed on the two firearms found in the vehicle with Perry uh, confirmed that those weapons were used in the two murder investigations in the home, invest uh, home invasion robbery malicious wounding investigation. The police had received reliable information that Perry was in town for the purpose of committing a murder and they were moving in the direction of the intended victim's residence. The officers had sufficient reasonable suspicion to stop Perry at that point in time and take him into custody if they found him to be in possession of firearms. It was Mr. Perry who chose to change the circumstances that night when he opened fire on the police. The SWAT officers' uniforms and tactical gear were clearly marked police. They identified themselves as law enforcement by yelling, police, show me your hands repeatedly as they approached Perry. Perry still chose to open fire rather than surrender. 
Now, I, I know that you hear that four rounds are fired by Mr. Perry and 30 rounds are returned by the police officers. Um, I do not find the 30 rounds to be excessive in any way. And let me explain why. Number one, you have four officers who were shooting. Number two, the United States Supreme Court has specifically told us if police officers are justified in firing at a suspect in order to end a severe threat to public safety, the officers need not stop firing until the threat has ended. The officers started shooting once Perry shot at them. They stopped shooting once Perry lowered his weapon. Based on the substantial evidence in this case and the law of this matter, I've come to the conclusion that the four Virginia Beach police officers involved in the shooting that night on September 5th did not violate the law and will not be prosecuted for any criminal offenses related to the death of Angelo Perry. India Kager is a different situation than Angelo Perry's. There is absolutely no information that India Kager was participating in the illegal activity that Mr. Perry was committing. The examination then of Mrs. of Miss Kager's death is different than that of Perry's. However, the examination begins with whether the officers were justified in discharging their firearms at Perry. As we've already discussed, Perry opened fire on them. They were within their legal rights to return fire to protect themselves, their fellow officers, and any citizens that were out at the scene at that time. So they were justified in firing their weapons. So when it comes to the death of Ms. Kager, all of the officers were aiming their fire at Mr. Perry. None of the officers targeted Ms. Kager. In fact, what is perfectly clear after reviewing all of the evidence is that Perry, it was Perry that placed Ms. Kager and their child in danger. Rather than surrendering to the clearly marked police officers who were yelling, police show me your hands, he chose to draw a firearm and shoot at the officers knowing that Ms. Kager was sitting next to him and knowing that their child was in the back seat of the vehicle. In addition to that, it was Mr. Perry who turned his body and positioned it in such a manner that he placed Ms. Kager directly in the officer's line of fire. There is a very interesting note that I think was significant in the medical examiner's autopsy of Ms. Kager. It says the 10 bullet defects identified at autopsy may have been produced by seven or eight bullets. A number of the entrances are atypical, and some of these may represent re-entry from bullets that exited the adjacent victim, Perry. However, these may also represent bullets which perforated glass or portions of the vehicle. Therefore, the number of bullets which struck the decedent after striking the adjacent Perry cannot be determined by the autopsy. So what the medical examiner is explaining to us is they are unable to determine what, if any, of the bullets that hit Ms. Kager actually passed through Mr. Perry and into Ms. Kager as a result of him positioning his body in that fashion. It was these decisions by Mr. Perry and not the actions of the officers that resulted in Ms. Kager's death. As a result, Again, due to the substantial evidence collected in this matter and my review of the law, I find that the officers did not violate the law, were legally justified in their actions on that evening, and there will be no criminal charges against uh, any of the four police officers uh, regarding the death of India Kager. This is a extremely traumatic set of circumstances to have happened in our city, traumatic for uh, the Perry family, traumatic for the Kager family, but also very traumatic for the officers involved. Um, my heart goes out to absolutely everybody involved in this matter. 
and it truly can be described as nothing other than tragic for all involved. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you mentioned that prior to the shooting, detectives were aware that there was a female driver and a possible third person in the back seat prior to the shooting. So can you talk a little bit about how you factored that into your analysis of this? Sure, absolutely. Um, I will say this. The, the uh, determination as to whether the officers acted criminally is based on whether they were justified in discharging their firearms. They had made the determination that since they had, they believed were spotted by Perry and, and that they were identified as following him and that they were moving closer to this intended victim's house, that it was, it was the opportunity at that point to try and stop him and take him into custody before any violent act could in fact occur. Um, the, the going up to the vehicle to take him into custody was in fact the officer's intentions. It was Perry who then turned it into an exchange of firefight. How many times would you have been shot? Um, well, I, I will say this. The, and we've already discussed Ms. Kager a little bit, and, and again, that was seven to eight gunshot wounds, um, which created 10 perforations on the body. Okay, but again, they cannot tell which rounds that hit her had actually gone through through Perry. In Mr. Perry's autopsy, they stated that they were unable to give an accurate accounting as to how many rounds had hit Perry because the, the paths of the rounds crossed um, inside Mr. Perry's body, making it impossible for them to give an accurate accounting of what round went where. They did give a rough estimate that 15 to 25 rounds entered Mr. Perry's body, um, but that does not include grazing wounds. Any shots in the back seat? I'm sorry, no. There were no shots in the back seat. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Um, India's mom has been very vocal in all of this, you know, as you're well aware of. You know, what is your response to her wanting to get the Department of Justice involved? Well, that's entirely up to the Department of Justice. I feel very confident that the Virginia Beach Police Department, as well as my office, have conducted very thorough investigations into this matter. Um, and I feel that this is the, the only decision available based on the evidence and the law. If, if the Justice Department is interested in coming in, that's up to them. We have nothing to do with that. They're welcome to come and review anything that, that uh, we have. Yes, sir. So, so you, you said that they identified themselves as uh, police officers, but they used a, a flashbang, right? They had one or two of these concussion type uh, devices. Uh, so, did they do that before they announced that they were police? And then, do we know whether Mr. Perry was in a position to understand that police were approaching the vehicle? Well, obviously, there's no way for me to state whether Mr. Perry was, uh, what Mr. Perry was going on in his mind at that particular time. I will say this, police procedures and, and tactics are a question for the police department. It's not a question for me. Uh, my review is of the law. I will say that it's my understanding that a flashbang does not render someone completely blind and deaf, but it is merely a distraction device that police use in an attempt to bring the officers up to the, the SWAT officers up to the point where they're trying to get to. But again, that question is better posed to um, Chief Savannah. I know you talked about um, the fact that they decided to take him down there because they were compromised. In a situation like that, where you're talking about a 7-Eleven with a lot of people coming in and out, does that factor into your thinking that maybe they should have waited to find a more secluded area instead of doing it at 7-Eleven where we're talking about uh, dozens of people who could have been hurt instead? Certainly. I understand the question, and I understand that that's a question that the public may have as to why the choice of that location. I'll simply say again, that is outside my scope of review. My review is not to determine whether the police picked the right location. My, my review is not to determine whether the police used the right tactics. My review is solely to determine whether the officers acted criminally when they discharged their firearm. And the answer to that is no, because Mr. Perry fired upon them first. 
And, and I, I think I, I uh, skipped a, a uh, bit of information that, that I, I should share with you all. The fact that Mr. Perry fired his weapon first is not based solely on the four SWAT officers that discharged their firearms. There were multiple police witnesses out there at the scene at the time, as well as civilian witnesses out there at the scene. Um, one of the civilian witnesses who were parked in a vehicle to, to the left uh, of these events taking place stated that, that uh, he distinctively heard two soft gunshots and then he heard multiple louder gunshots after those two distinctive sounds. Um, that type of description was consistent throughout witness statements. Um, police um, statements, uh, it, was, it was consistent as well. And um, in fact, one of the officers was very clear that he heard two um, handgun rounds being fired and then heard multiple rifle rounds uh, being discharged. And his explanation was quite simple of, it's very distinctive sounds. You can tell the difference between a handgun and a rifle being discharged. And it was very clear to all the witnesses um, that, that that was similar. Some of the witnesses, um, the police witnesses were specifically uh, positioned behind the Cadillac and they were able to see Perry pull his weapon and discharge it at the officers first. Can you talk about the role that the Seven Eleven surveillance video had in all this and why you decided to release it? Absolutely. I, I, I have um, no issues with releasing the video. I know that that was a common request. And, and the issue with the video, however, is that the camera at the 7-Eleven was out of focus. Um, you've all been given copies uh, of the video, and you'll see for yourselves that um, it is not the clearest video that everybody would like to have. Um, you can certainly see the vehicles pulling up. You can see the flashbang going out. You can see the officers coming up to the vehicle. And you can see that clearly something is going on between the officers and, and Mr. Perry. But unfortunately, you cannot make out specific details in it. Um, that is what led me to my request um, that the state lab take a look at the video and see if there is any way that they can enhance it. That's why you have two different videos that you've been provided. One is the original video, the other is the enhanced version. Um, unfortunately, they came back and stated to us there is really nothing they can do with an unfocused camera. They were able to clarify it a little bit. They were able to lighten it a little bit. But they, they, in the end, they said the camera was unfocused, and, and as a result, they cannot. Um, I think that it is an important piece of information. I think it is. it does corroborate in many ways exactly what the officer said took place as they came up. Um, would it be nice to have a clearer video? It absolutely would be. Uh, but I think the evidence is, is still um, overwhelming in this matter as to what took place that night. And India's mom, one more. India's mom, I mean, obviously wants to have a different outcome in all this. What do you have to say to her? Well, I, I, I've talked to Miss um, Best before I came down here. I, I was on the phone with Miss Best. Um, obviously, she is not happy with, with my determination. Um, I, I tried to express to her my, my sincere apology and, and that my heart went out to her and her entire family um, on this. Um, obviously, um, she wanted very different results here. Uh, but the role of a prosecutor is not to um, succumb to passion. It's not to succumb to any kind of outside influences, whether it's from uh, whatever side it comes from. And basically, my review and my role is to be the impartial individual who examines the evidence in the law and comes to a conclusion. Um, it's not my job, unfortunately, to, to make everybody happy. Um, and, and I have to make tough decisions in these matters. So is she happy with it? Absolutely not. Um, so, uh, but I, I do feel that the evidence in this case is overwhelming. I feel that the law is clear. And, and I do feel 
that um, that the the proper decision here is exactly what I've stated, and that is that the officers did not commit any kind of criminal act on September 5th. Yes, sir. So just to, again, the, uh, the police department withheld the names of the officers. I, I, can, can you speak, to, was there a, a reason that the names were withheld this long and they're now being released? I mean, there, there was a discussion of there being some kind of vaguely described threat. I, I don't know that we ever got into specifics, but is that, that situation changed for the officers? There, there, there have been threats uh, in general to the police officers, and I know that that was the police department's concerns, and I know that that was the police officers' concerns. And, and you know, as it had been expressed to me by the officers, um, they all signed up to be police officers, um, but their families didn't choose to put themselves in harm's way. And, and they were very concerned um, for, for their families um, with their names being released. Um, I, I did meet with the officers. Um, they they um, would have preferred their names not being in the report. And we did discuss it at length, and I explained that, that I believed it wasn't very important for their names to be in the report. Um, I believe it's important because we have a situation here where we have government agents who have taken the lives of two citizens, and I think it, it would be wrong for us to turn around at that point and say, we're not going to divulge who it is that did it. Um, I think they all understood um, after we've had that conversation, and um, each and every one of them are very dedicated public servants who this has had an emotional, emotional toll on each and every one of them. And uh, while I know that, that the Hager family and the, and the Perry family are in pain, um, this has not been easy on the officers as well. Sergeant, going back to the video real quick, was yes. it safe to say that in your analysis you solely relied on the officer's statements? Absolutely not. Um, I, I did factor the video into my analysis because the video does corroborate what other witnesses say. And, and so, again, there were civilian witnesses out at that 7-Eleven at the time. There were multiple police witnesses who were not there with, with the, or not a part of the SWAT team. Um, and, and so there were multiple vantage points from all over the 7-Eleven parking lot, whether police or civilian, that um, was the majority of the evidence in that case, coupled with the video that was able to corroborate what many of them said. Yes, ma'am. Were there other families that you told, in addition to the deaths, uh, have you told any other family members about this or uh, about this video? Uh, I, I've spoken to Ms. Best, and, and I've also spoken to Mr. Kager, who, who is the, the father of Indy Kager. I've also spoken to Mr. Perry's wife, um, and, and discuss the matter with her as well. I don't know if you know the answer to this, but you mentioned that the CI told detectives that he was going to kill somebody um, in the city. Um, do we know if there was drug involved um, or gang related at all? Or is that better for the police department to answer? Um, I'm, I'm not going to get into uh, any additional information regarding the confidential informant or activity related to that, um, suffice, it, suffice it to say, the informant was able to provide specific information um, related to those murder cases and that home invasion case and then this intended murder um, that, that was supposedly taking place here in Virginia Beach. Is it safe to say that he was a hitman, Perry? Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to call Mr. Perry a hitman. That is clearly what the, the information came out to appear that there was a hit put on and he was coming down to perform it. So um, I, I'll let you and your viewers decide what exactly Mr. Perry was. Can you talk about the babies and um, them finding the baby in the backseat? Um, what kind of condition was it? Was it was seized? I, it is my understanding that when the officers removed the baby from the vehicle, the baby was crying. Um, they were able to to take a look at him, um, examine him head to toe, made sure that uh, he was not injured and, and not in need of medical care. Um, I, I know that the police department made uh, an attempt to get some 
some formula and diapers and that sort of thing for the child and then called Child Protective Services. And they would yes, never wear the baby until after it was issued? The, one of the surveillance vi uh, vehicles did state that there was a possibility that there was a third person in the back seat of the vehicle, but they did not know there was an infant there until after the shooting had, had completed. Okay. Thank you all very much.